All right, let's meet together in Acts chapter number one. Acts chapter number one. Lord willing, we'll finish this chapter. There are some important things we need to discover before we get to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two is all about Pentecost. Uh, you've heard of that before. Uh, we'll talk about what is necessary to lead up to that. That's what's happening here in these closing verses, the second half of Acts chapter 1, verse number 12, uh, all the way through verse number 26. Hope you'll follow along as I read Acts chapter 1, verse 26. All right, everybody on the main floor, you got it? Say yes. yes. Balcony, you're looking good today. You got the Bible open? Say yes. yes. All right. There might be more of you up there than on the main floor today. I'm not sure. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 12 says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120, gives us just an idea of what size was there in the upper room. And Peter says, verse 16, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning before Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Not a pretty picture, but that's what we're told happened to Judas. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that it, as that field is called in their uh, proper tongue, Alkaldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias, and they prayed and said, Lord, thou, Lord, which showest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Well, the message is entitled today, The Cost of Pentecost the cost of Pentecost. Let's pray. Father, I pray that uh, we will find ourselves in the place of blessing today, that we'll do what's necessary uh, to see the power of God upon our lives, upon our families, upon this church. Help us to be willing and understand what that cost is. Help us to be willing to pay the price. Lord, give us great uh, warmth and, and unity around the Word of God and Scriptures today. Please fill me with your Spirit. Use me. Speak through me. Help me to preach with clarity and conviction today. And we'll give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Pentecost. You've heard of Pentecost. I'm a little bit loud for some reason. During I was reading scripture, I got loud, and I'm not sure. Pentecost is the dramatic outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we see unfolding for us in Acts chapter 2. It resulted, uh, back in the early church, it resulted in, in spoken, varied spoken languages. It, 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 the power of God fell. The passionate preaching of Peter led to the conversion of thousands of souls. It is, it is the major hinge of the book of Acts. It is the major turning point of the book of Acts, and, and without it, the early church would not have been ignited. It, is an, it was an unprecedented time of growth and, and power and salvations and just God doing something that was amazing. So Pentecost 
represents for us today something that we as a church should still long for. Not, not in all the various details that we see unfolding in Acts chapter 2, but what I'm saying is we should still long for a mighty move of God. Hello? Do you? Are we really expecting when we come to church on, what is this, January 14th, are we really expecting every time we come to the Lord's house that we're going to see God do something and see a powerful moving of the Lord. You know, our attention this year is on this word follow. We're going to, fo- our desire is to follow the Lord. And this, this desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ is all about uh, uh, getting in line to see God do something special in 2024. But, but does it just happen? Is it just automatic? Can we just like, have Laura make a new graphic for our, our website, and can I just pick a word and, and, and then pick a book of the Bible and say, well, let's just go for it and see what happens. Can, is, it just, can, is there anything that we need to do? We're guilty sometimes. Stay with me. This is going to be a little bit longer introduction, but we'll get cruising. We're guilty sometimes, oftentimes, of wanting the power of Pentecost without the price of Pentecost. We're guilty many times of wanting the power of God without truly understanding what we need to do to get ourselves in line, to get ourselves right there plugged into that power source. We want the wages without the work, right? We, we want to get paid without showing up to work. We want, we want the blessing without the business. We, we, we want the product without the pain. My son plays on a basketball team. They're 10 and 0. Berean Academy's 10 and 0. They're not getting a whole lot of press in the community, but they're 10 and 0. They haven't lost yet. And everyone wants to go out there, wants to make baskets, want to play good defense, want to have the endurance to play a game. But you got to go to practice. Every kid I know in school wants straight A's. You got to study. You got to put in the time. You have to be diligent. We, we we're guilty of just expecting to have have uh, success without striving. And all these things help us understand that, that there is a cost to Pentecost. And uh, with the results we see unfolding in the next chapter. Now, I need, to, I need to back up theologically. I need to lay a little bit of groundwork. So go back in your Bibles to John chapter 14. You got a Bible? It'll be on the screen, but take your Bibles. Go back to John chapter 14. I need to establish a timeline and a theology of what's happening here with this imparting of the Spirit. That's what, it's really part of Pentecost. That's a major part of Pentecost is the power and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the early church and on God's people, on believers. So let's back Back up, John 14, and look at verse 16 and 17. The Bible says, Jesus talking, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Here's verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. Now, listen. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. That, little, that last little phrase, it's on the screen, it's in your Bibles. Could you say that last phrase with me, starting with, for he dwelleth. Say this with me. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. We're, we're backing up here for a reason. We're backing up so we can establish a, a, a theology and a foundation for the imparting of the Spirit. Now, first thing that Jesus says to these disciples, this is before the cross. John 14 is before the cross. And he's saying that the Holy Spirit, and the key word is dwells. This is the moment that Jesus Christ is teaching. His, it's a very passionate moment. Jesus teaches from like John 14 to, to all the way up to John 18 or 19 in the upper room discourse. And he says there's this Holy Spirit. He dwells with you. It's the Greek word para. Can you all say para? You know a little Greek. And it's the Greek word para. And it means to be with or to dwell with to be near or to be around. So get it, please stay with me. This is so important. Jesus is saying there's something that's around us right now. There's something that's dwelling with us. It's near to us. It's the Spirit. And so he's saying kind of like the Holy Spirit's working, he's moving in very the same way that we would say and, and, and say that a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has to begin to work, has to begin to be around and surround someone as that person is drawn to Christ. So that's, that's a very important preposition and it means dwell. 
Para means dwell. But then it changes. We read it. You quoted it with me. It says, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So you understand that dwelleth with you is present tense and shall be in you is future tense. And so that little word in in English, I-N, in Greek is en, E-N. And it means just what the word in means in English. It means in. It means that there is coming a day, Jesus is saying this, Jesus is laying a groundwork, he's telling them what's about to happen. He's saying right now the Holy Spirit dwells, para, with us, but there is coming a time in the future. And verse 17 is the future promise that the Holy Spirit would one day be in them. Now turn to John chapter 20. I'm trying to move quickly. You're doing good listening. Uh, John chapter 20 and verses 19 through 23 happens to be such another important time where Jesus is alone in a room with his disciples. Now, this is after the cross. In fact, it's after the burial. It's after the resurrection. Jesus Christ shows them the scars. He's been to the cross. The cross is what purchases our salvation. The victory was sealed by him resurrecting from the dead. He he, uh, morphs through a door. He's in the room. He shows them the scars and his driven side, and and they believe that this is the risen Lord. This is effectively, church, by the way, a time that we could say this is when they truly received Christ as their Savior. This is when they placed faith in the risen Lord. So the Bible doesn't, that's kind of using our modern day terminology of becoming a Christian, kind of overlaying it backwards on the disciples. They were following Jesus. They, they, tr- they were trusting in Jesus. But this is finally that culmination where Jesus shows them their, the crucifixion scars and when effectively they got saved. And so notice what it says here in this passage. Let's read verses 20 through uh, uh, 23. It says, 19 verse, let's start there. That same day of the evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, and came Jesus and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be unto you. When he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side, Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. When he had said this, watch it, he breathed on them the Holy Ghost, uh, and whoever said, whoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whoever sins you retain, they are retained. So this is where it starts to happen. He says back in John 14, Holy Spirit's going to be, he's with you. Uh, secondly, in John 14, he's going to be in you. And then John 20 is where he, he starts to give them the Holy Spirit. He starts to breathe on them. Now turn, you're probably there. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. We read this last week, covered it last week. We covered it a little bit last time. But Acts 1, 8 says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost. Notice this preposition. Is come upon you. We got para, meaning with, to dwell. We have en, meaning in, dwelling in you. Now we have upon, which is the little Greek word epi, epi. And it means to be upon, to be over, or overflowing, to be uh, completely immersed. That's what it's talking about. You see the Tell me, you see the, the progression. Tell me you see the progression from with to in to breathing and now on, upon, sur- filling you. It's where we get our idea, epi is kind of the idea of baptism, is where we get our idea of, of baptism when we baptize folks and we'll do, do so shortly, I hope, is we, we immerse them. They are surrounded, they are, they are encased in water and it's showing that idea that it's like that baptism or the coming upon of the Holy Spirit. Here, now put all this together, all right? Put all this together. We need to understand this. There is a difference between the indwelling of the Spirit at conversion and the overflowing and powerful filling of the Spirit after salvation. What we're talking about today. I, I don't know, I'm not sure you understand because you're kind of like giving me the glassy stare. All right? This is just a simple principle. There is a difference between the indwelling of the Spirit at your salvation and the outpouring and the immersion and the filling of the Spirit sometime subsequent to your salvation, to your conversion. 
With that in mind, let's talk about four things that make up this cost to Pentecost. If, if this is what we want, if I want this upon, and by, by the way, we do, we want this upon. I want, I want to have the baptism of the Spirit. I want to be filled with the Spirit. You think, well, that, right, I'm getting nervous here, Pastor. Are we charismatic? Please notice that the very first person to talk about the baptism of the Spirit was John the Baptist. He was a Baptist, all right? We're not going to let the charismatics, Pentecostals, take it from us. He, well, he was a Baptist. I mean, he just simply claimed the Bible. And so don't, don't panic, but this filling of the Spirit is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But there are some things that we need to have as prerequisites. Number one is obedience. Number one is obedience. And we're back in our passage. That was all groundwork. Thank you for listening. So after being asked by the angels, um, why are you staring up into the sky? Verse 11, verse 12. They were gazing up there kind of, all right, Jesus said he's coming again. I guess he's coming back right now. And the angels are like, dudes, go get to work. Go, go do what he told you to do. And so the, the Bible says in verse 12 that the disciples returned to Jerusalem. Church, there's only one reason why they returned to Jerusalem. Jesus told them to. And they were obedient. They went where they were supposed to go. They did what they were supposed to do. And in verse 4, that's where that comes from. Verse 4, Jesus says, go to Jerusalem. Verse where you can see it, I'm not going to read it all, but it says, wait for the promise of the Father. And so the first thing that Jesus tells them to do after he ascends to heaven is he says, go back to Jerusalem and hurry up and wait. Acts is a book of acts, uh, action. It's a book of, of activity. But the very first thing the disciples are told to do is not activity. It's they're told to wait. They are not to do anything until they obey. They don't have to do anything until they get back there to where Jesus has told them to be and to wait for the Holy Spirit. So what did they do in that upper room? How, how long were they waiting? How long were they in that upper room? Do you know that Pentecost means 50? And Pentecost stands for this event that happens 50 days after the resurrection. Stay with me because there's math involved in this, all right? Too early for math? So Pentecost, what number does Pentecost mean? Right. How many days did Jesus appear to his disciples after resurrection and he was seen of over 500 witnesses? How many days did that last? 40 days. So how many days does that, if they went right after the ascension, right after uh, this time, they went to Jerusalem to wait, how long do you think, if you just do the math, how long did they wait? If you said 10 days, you went to school while they were still teaching math. Good job. Good job. You, 50 minus 40. I hope you didn't get out your calculator for that one. You should have known that one by head. All right, so 10 days, they, um, they, what do they do during that 10 days? That's what we're talking about. This passage in Acts chapter 1, 12 through 20, is all about what they did for those 10 days, how they passed that 10-day interval while they were waiting for the Spirit. They walk back from the Mount of Olives back to Jerusalem, probably about a half mile walk, probably 10, 15 minutes if you're in sandals, and think about how that must have felt, how, how that, what kind of anticipation they would have walked back there thinking something's about to happen, Something, something's about to explode. We're about to see God move mightily. Can you imagine the, the fear and, the, and the, the excitement and the anticipation of all these things, the uncertainty they would have had? But when, and one small thing stood in their way of all these things they were expecting, and it's a little thing called obedience. They had to go where Jesus told them to go. He said, go back to Jerusalem and wait there, and that's what they did. This is so simple. I can't believe I'm preaching on it. Here we go. They could not have gone to another city and received the Spirit. They, Bethlehem's a cool place. How about Nazareth? A lot of stuff happened in the region of Galilee. Why, why can't we go back there? Why can't we go back to where the Sermon on the Mount was preached? Let's, let's go there and wait. Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem. They could not have gone anywhere else and experienced the power of God. Jesus told them where to go, and when the fire of God fell, 10 days later, we're so impatient. We want God to do, we're not willing to put in the work. The work involves obedience and waiting and trusting. And, and 10 days later, when the power of God fell, when the fire of God fell, when the blessing of God fell, they were right there. 
ready for it. Can I ask you something? Are you right there? Right now, are you right there? Where is there? There is where God told you to be. There is living in obedience. There is there with your family. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to divert. Just talk about your family. We, 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 want, we want financial stability. We want health. And we want our kids to do what's right and be successful. And yet we have sometimes husbands and wives and moms and dads living in a way contrary to Scripture, living contrary to obedience. They're living actually in disobedience in very, very many ways. They're living, they're not full of character. They've they got impure thoughts, impure images, impure activities in their life. There's, there's, there's no real drive to do what Jesus says to do or do what the Bible says to do. But yet, where's the blessing? I want the blessing. I want the blessing. I, 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 want, to, I, I want peace. I, 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 want, I want comfort. I want financial stability. I want all these things. And these are just very few, just a random listing of minor tangible blessings that we can kind of feel. I want God to bless me. Are you living a blessable life? Are you there where he, where he wants you? We see this in Scripture. Uh, like Elijah, Elijah was told by God um, in the middle of a famine. Elijah said there's going to be a famine. He was part of it. God sometimes allows the believers to go through what the world goes through and suffer the way the world suffers. And so God tells Elijah, uh, go to Cherith, Cherith, the brook, and ravens will feed you there. Elijah had to go there. Do you believe that? He had to go there. If he, let's say, hey, I heard there's food 20 miles away. I'm going to go there. I believe if he had gone to some other city where there was food, where there wasn't a famine, he still would have starved because God told him to go to Cherith. I think about Naaman in the Bible. Naaman was a leper, and he was told through a prophet to wash yourself, wash himself in Jordan River. Why the muddy, muddy Jordan River? If he had gone to any other body of water, any other little stream, any other pool of water for healing or to be cleansed, he would not have got cleansed of his leprosy. It wasn't a hard thing. God was asking of him. He just needed to obey, and he did obey, and he was made whole. I'm saying this. We need to be characterized as an obedient church full of obedient Christians. Simple obedience. You're, you're doing good. You're doing good with lots of things in your life. Are you where you're supposed to be? Are you when you're supposed to be? Are you living how you're supposed to live? We need to be obedient in church faithfulness and obedient in tithing and good financial stewardship. We need to be obedient in sharing our faith. We need to be obedient in uh, leading our homes well as men and women. As husbands and wives, as Christian parents, we need to be obedient and faithful in our sunset years, in our 60s and 70s. We need to be obedient in all areas, obedient as a teenager to, to be pure and to be careful with social media and be obedient to read your Bible. There's so many ways we can say, let's just be obedient. It's not hard to do what God requires of us. It's just find yourself in the place of obedience. Just do what God tells you to do. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing? If our church, if Calvary Baptist Church could be classified just like the early church was classified as being a church that was there right where God wanted them to be. Where God has told us to be. Where is there? There is where God has told us to be and what God tells us to do, we do. And I'm telling you this, this is a big statement. God does not pour out his blessing on disobedient Christians. Occasionally, God, in his mercy and grace, will allow your life to coast along just fine. But if you really want more, if you really want to get serious and really experience the power of God upon your life, God's not going to pour that out if you're disobedient. It doesn't work that way. And whatever is, is good for the uh, goose is good for the gander. It's good for the church, too. God God says there is a price to be paid. If you'll just do what I tell you to do, that price of obedience. I'm talking from the pulpit to the pew. We'd all do well to realize that our disobedience can affect the whole body and keep God's power out of here. The first one's obedience. Secondly, we're talking about the cost of Pentecost. Number one is obedience. Number two is unity. And we're up to verse 14. Verse 14 uh, describes some of the qualities of this upper room group, and it says these all continue with one accord. 
I'm thirsty. Give me one second. How many disciples are in this upper room right now? How many disciples? More math, I know, not fair. <laughs> Judas had his bowels gush out. Judas hanged himself. We're, we're informed here what happened to Judas after his betrayal. He killed himself with that guilt and that shame. More about him later. But in this upper room, in this upper room in Acts chapter 1 are 11 remaining disciples. There's members of Jesus' earthly family. He had half-brothers, half-sisters perhaps. And these, many of them did not believe in him fully in his lifetime. Evidently, the resurrection changed their minds. We also uh, have Mary, the mother of Jesus in this room, and other women which follow the Lord, a couple other Marys, Salome, other people in the Scripture. Listen, as a side note, by the way, this is the last glimpse we have of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the last time she shows up in the Bible. For the benefit of our Catholic friends, people that understand the revering and the elevating that the Catholic Church does to Mary, the mother of Jesus, the last glimpse we have of Mary in Scripture is not some idolatrous worship service of herself. She's simply with the other people in the upper room. She needed Jesus as well. She needed the Savior she birthed in this world. So the last image we have of Mary is here. But, but the, the point is they're all united. They're all here and they're in prayer and, and, and with the other disciples. And verse, verse 15 says there are about 120 people. Now stop, stop. Only 120. Only 120 at this point, 50, 40 days after uh, the resurrection, only 120 people are at that point in biblical history committed followers of Jesus Christ. And they're obedient. Only 120 are obedient. And they're there and we're focusing on their unity because the point to ponder right now is how unity plays into the cost of Pentecost. The Bible says over and over, over and over in Acts, it says they were in one accord. One accord. It's why I drive a Honda. I stay in one accord. It is my civic responsibility. And I, I, I'm on a passport to whatever kind of odyssey God has for me. Mm, waited all week for that. Wrote it down. Planned it out. That's just a prelude. Okay, back to it. They were uh, in uh, 114, uh, one accord. 2 1, one accord. <laughs> 246, one accord. 424, I'm, this book of Acts, Acts 424, one accord. Acts 512, one accord. This, this unity wasn't natural to them, but it was there. It wasn't natural. It wasn't always there either, but it was there now. With this group that was assembled in this upper room, how easy it would be, I mean, for these personalities. We got, we got some personalities in this room. That way, yeah, thank you, baby. <laughs> we got some personalities up in here. We're different. We have different opinions about dozens and dozens of matters. How easy it would have been for, for pride and for the diverse uh, nature of this group and, and, and the, the, the divisions that had characterized the disciples even in the past. How easy it would have been for these things to hinder this group of believers. The members of Jesus. Hey, hey if you were Jesus' half-brother, I mean, now's the time to, to kind of step and say, oh, 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 I'm his half-brother. The members of Jesus' family in this group of 120, they could have requested special privileges or special treatment. Peter, Peter could have been criticized for his cowardly denial of Jesus. Peter's one that stands up in a moment and kind of bosses the group around, which we'll see. But John, the apostle John might have reminded them, hey, I was the only one that stood there at the cross with, the, with Jesus' mother. I was there. Where were the rest of you? But once all that's out of the way. Once they're here and, and now for maybe the first time, the disciples aren't arguing among themselves who the greatest is. 
imagine there was not only that, but a great deal of apologizing that might have gone on. Maybe Martha went to Mary and apologized for being critical of her worship while Mary was in the, uh, Martha was in the kitchen, working in the kitchen. Mary, Mary was there worshiping, and she, she said, Jesus, make her stop. Make her come help me. Maybe Martha apologized to Mary. Maybe Mary said that, yeah, that wasn't always the best time. Maybe I should have helped out more at home. They hug and they make up, and now they're in one accord. James and, and John, the sons of thunder, they stand up and, and they approach the other disciples and they apologize for sending their mom to try to get special treatment in heaven for them, special seats in heaven. Like, yeah, that was not our brightest moment. Sorry, fellas. They ask for forgiveness. Disciples say, you're forgiven. Let's move on. They're in unity. Maybe Thomas stands up and says, man, I, sorry I wasn't around. I was so doubtful. I was so unsure that it was that what was going on, and I apologize for calling all of you liars. <laughs> when I finally saw Jesus, it, it all made sense, and he admits his weakness and his failure, and everyone in that group, everyone, several people that, that we see glimpses of that are uh, not pretty pictures in the Gospels, they, they realize, man, I was arrogant, I was egotistical. I was self-centered. I was thinking only of myself. I was prideful. They asked for forgiveness. They got it, and now there is unity. And I'm telling you, obedience, unity, God is quick to bless churches like that. God wants to bless churches like that. Where the members, listen, where the members are all quick to forgive, which necessitates being quick in asking for forgiveness, where the church family gives everyone the benefit of the doubt, fair to each other, no grudges, no personal preferences getting in the way. We're quick to allow people to think differently than us on, on matters that, that really don't matter. A church that's filled with peacemakers, not troublemakers, They sensed that they were on the edge of something and they wanted it. They sensed they were on the edge of a mighty move of God, something big, something great. It was about to happen. It would turn their world upside down. It would change the world and the church forever. And they agreed this is no time for petty arguing and petty squabbles and for me to gossip, and for me to complain. It's, there's no time for that. For my, there's no time for my hurt feelings and my being offended and my power struggles. Power struggles will destroy a church. You understand me? Each in that moment, 120 of them, that's a good-sized church. They were living for something bigger than themselves, and that's the kind of church that God blesses. There is no Pentecost without obedience, and there is no Pentecost without unity. Number three, there is no Pentecost without prayer. Verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer. Jesus told them to wait, and they passed the time by praying. Ten days. When's the last time the average Christian prayed ten minutes? They pass the time by praying. One of the best things a church can do while waiting for God to give them direction is pray. One of the best things a pastor can do when seeking the Lord about the direction of a church is pray. The people did not just pray, beloved. They prayed together. They prayed specifically. They prayed consistently. They prayed steadfastly. And so 
when God's people are on the verge of something powerful, a mighty move of God, they need to be found praying. Prayer is a prerequisite for the power of God. All these people in this upper room were united in prayer. One important key, John Calvin said this, he said two ingredients to powerful prayer are one mind and perseverance. If you can get some unity and some consistency to a church's prayer life, you're gonna see something happen. E.M. Bounds, you get a hold of this little book by E.M. Bounds. You can find, it's a classic, you can read it, and reread it and reread it and it'll bless you every time. You can read it in about 45 minutes. E.M. Bounds, power through prayer. E period, M period, bound. Back then people all went by their initials. I would be G.T. Powell. E.M. Bounds, power through prayer. And he lists in that book, what a great book. It's a classic. You should read it. It'll change your prayer life. He lists men of God who knew how to pray. Here's what he says. He says, men of whom it could be said, the most notable feature of their lives was prayer. What, it makes me wonder, what is the most notable feature of my life? Sarcasm? Incredibly good looks? I don't know. Humility? No. Seriously, what is the most notable feature of your Christian life? These, these men that he lists, I'll give them to you. Um, uh, Charles Simeon, English revivalist, he prayed from four to eight each morning. It was said that John Fletcher, an English preacher, stained the walls of his room by the breath of his prayers. Martin Luther said, if I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets victory throughout the day. I mentioned this Wednesday night, I believe it was Martin Luther. He prayed regularly two hours a day. On days he was really busy, he said he prayed three hours a day. Um, John Welch, a Scottish preacher, thought the day was ill spent if he didn't spend eight hours in prayer. Edward Payson in the early 1800s it said that he wore grooves into his hardwood floors where his praying knees pressed in so often. Adoniram Judson was not a talented man. He was not eloquent or educated or even uh, uh, popular, but he prayed. It was said of Adoniram Judson that many men of greater gifts and genius and leaning and learning uh, than, have, than he have made no such impression as he did. I misspoke there, but I hope you understood what I was saying. He wasn't that talented, educated, or eloquent, but God used him because he prayed. Realistically, there's no way in our day and age we can probably, most of us, spend eight hours praying, but you get the point, don't you? And so if you can get 120 people, probably around 400, more than 400 in here in church today, and this, this, on this property, kids included, if you can get 120 plus and get 300, 400 people praying, praying for something, praying with unity, praying because they're walking in obedience. I think you'll see the power of God. Unified prayer, continual prayer for, for days, days and days and weeks and weeks in a row can really lead to God doing some amazing things. If we can get some unity in our prayer meetings, if we can get some more of you to come pray with us on Wednesdays, and realize this is a discipline. It's, 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 it, it might seem monotonous. It might seem, it might seem difficult and mundane and routine. We can get some more people in this church who are praying uh, to, to persevere in their prayer life and to come to prayer meetings. We can unleash the power of God. No church will ever see God do Pentecost. No church will ever see God do great things unless that church becomes characterized by being a church of prayer. John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress, said prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan. There is no Pentecost without prayer. And finally, number four, decision. The cost of Pentecost is obedience, unity, prayer, and now this last one, decision. If I could 
go back and rewrite my outline, I'll probably, I might call this word trust, but let's just go with decision for right now. Decision. Please stay with me. I'm going to hurry up. I got to go. I got to catch a plane somewhere, okay? So I got to go someplace before you do, all right? But I'm the one preaching. So the bulk of this passage, verses really 15 through 26, the bulk of this passage reveals to us that those in the upper room just really wanted God to lead them. They, they, they really desired God's leading. So Peter, Peter takes a prominent role. Uh, Peter sticks his foot out <laughs> in the Gospels. He sticks his tongue out in Acts. He finally, he, he, he takes a prominent role in Acts as well, and it's a, it's a good light. He stands up. He gets them all thinking about Judas. Well, thanks, buddy. We weren't really thinking about Judas, but now we are. And we're glad he did because he tells us some things and kind of closes the loop on Judas. And Judas was that character in the New Testament who proves it's possible to be close to Jesus Christ and actually not have a relationship with him. And I hope that's not you today. I hope you're not here and you're warming the seat today and you're, you're participating. I hope that it's not said of you that like Judas, he was close to the truth, but he wasn't committed to the truth. So Peter gets people thinking about Judas and we're thinking about what it truly means to decide to follow Jesus and so, so Judas, in betraying the Lord Jesus Christ and killing himself, he left an opening in the ranks of the disciples. Now, for a number of biblical and prophetic reasons, there needed to be 12, 12 disciples or apostles, as they are now starting to be called. The qualifications of what it needs to be in a life of someone who's qualified to be an apostle is in verses 21 and 22 of chapter 1. But I'll give it to you. An apostle is uh, said to have been, had to, not said to, had to have been a follower of Jesus and the disciples the last 40 days, as well as a uh, follower of Jesus since his baptism by John the Baptist. It says this in verses 21 and 22. And he had to have been an eyewitness of the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And so, the Bible tells us that in this upper room group, the two men that either rose to the surface or the two men that were only, the only two men that met these qualifications were uh, these two guys, Joseph, called Barsabbas, and a guy named Matthias. Now, so again, these are the 120 best followers of Jesus. 11 disciples are there, minus Judas, of course. Peter perhaps a little impetuous still. Peter's going Peter's to Peter, okay? He's going he's gonna to be bold. He's going to embarrass himself, but he's going to make a difference as well. So Peter is impetuous, and he decides that in addition to waiting and praying, what we should do is vote on a replacement for Judas. They need to cast lots, and they need to vote on Judas's replacement. This This... Stay with me, please. This is kind of historical. This is somewhat opinion, but it doesn't appear that God really directed this, but also God never says it's wrong. It doesn't appear really that this is what God prescribed for them to do, but the Bible says, and they're not forbidden. They're not forbidden because it happens, and the Bible says they essentially roll the dice. They cast lots. They're trying to figure out which one, Joseph or Matthias, and they're literally flipping a coin on this. They're literally flipping a coin. It's a 50-50 shot, and so they're casting lots. Here, here's, here's, this is important. I keep saying it. It's, it's all important. It's the Bible. This is the last time we find casting lots in the Bible. Why? Because once you have the Holy Spirit in your life, then he helps you make decisions. Once you have, see, if you're a coin-flipping Christian, it's like, stop it. You don't need to be doing that. I mean, God gives, gives us wisdom, and God gives us the ability to write down like a pros and cons list and to seek advice and seek counsel. But if you're like, all right, heads we move, tails we stay. <laughs> like, no. Heads I quit, tails I keep working 35 years. <laughs> 
Once you, see this is the last time casting lots appears in scripture because once the Holy Spirit is in you and filling you, then he gives discernment. He gives direction. He guides you into all truth. The, he's the spirit of truth. He'll guide you in that. So they end up, back to the story in Acts, they end up choosing Matthias. I mentioned that this may not have completely been um, you know, directed by God. I say that because one, one reason, two, two reasons. The first is this. Matthias is never again seen in Scripture. He could have been a good dude. He could, he could have done a lot of stuff for God. He could, have, he could have been a great evangelist, a great preacher, a great church planner. He could have been a great leader among the earth, but we just don't know. And so Matthias, is, we, we never hear from him again. The other reason I say that this might not be, have been directed by God is that we don't find out till later in Acts chapter nine that, um, that, the, that God's choice was clearly Paul. Saul met on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter nine about three times Saul's own testimony of meeting the Lord on the road to Damascus is recorded in Acts three or four times and he has chosen the other reason God's choice for that replacement apostle clearly appears later in Acts chapter nine and that was just some good background for us. But here is what we need to understand and I'm almost done. There's a cost to Pentecost. Here's what we need to understand. If there is obedience if there is unity, and if there is prayer. God gives his people great freedom to make decisions because they'll be in line with his will. If you're in obedience to the word of God, if you're unified with other believers around the word of God, if you're praying and seeking the Lord's face, you're delighting yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. You're in line for the blessing. You're right there where you need to be. God gives great freedom. What well, should I go with this job or, 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 or do this or buy this or purchase that? God gives you freedom and God gives you a will and human freedom to do that as long as you are walking sincerely with the Spirit. So what we have here in this section of Scripture, it's so important because next week we're looking at Acts 2 and it's Pentecost time. But what we see here in this section is that when we can get some believers together who are obedient, believers who are unified, believers who are praying and seeking the Lord and following the Lord and studying the scriptures, thinking through what choices reflect the fact that they are a follower of Jesus Christ and, and, and making those decisions, all of this puts us in line for Pentecost. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, the floodgates of blessing on us throw open wide, an old song says. Pentecostal power. There is a cost to Pentecost, my church. The formula is still solid today because the Bible doesn't, doesn't change these immutable principles. The fact that if any church wants to experience the blessing of God, and I do, and you do, we do together, we want to be right there and see God do some amazing things. We have to be willing to pay the cost of Pentecost. Are you? I want to know, are we as a church, is Calvary Baptist Church ready to pay the price? It's worth it. It's worth it. Acts 2 changed everything. It changed them. It changed the city. It changed the church. We must be committed if we are going to see God do something powerful here. Let's pray. God bless you for being here today. Let's stand as we are able. Heads bowed and eyes closed today. There are four things we must think about today. Four things, the cost of Pentecost. I'm wondering if you're willing today to spend some time praying for these four things, to align yourself, to help our church get aligned, to align yourself individually and help our church get aligned uh, organizationally and corporately, help our church get aligned with these four prerequisites. If you're not living in obedience today, if there is sin in your life, my friend, confess it and forsake it. If there's something, if there's aught between a brother or a sister in here, you need to restore some unity, do that. 
Or let's just maybe not be so picky. Let's be unified. Prayer. I want to be a person of prayer in 2024. Then as I do those things, then I'm going to choose. I have decided to follow Jesus. Now Christians, believers, followers of Christ right now, you and me, we're thinking about these four things, right? You think, you pray about them, you meditate, you ask the Spirit to move in your heart. What is he speaking to you about? What do you need to do about these four things? But let me just take a, a, a question to those of you who might be here today without Christ. If you're here without Christ, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, my friends, you are in the right place. God has you here today for a reason. Balcony, main floor, wherever you are, whoever you are, if you are here today and you don't have Christ as Savior, you've never made that decision to follow Christ and put your faith and trust in the work on the cross and repent of your sins and call upon the Lord to save you, you've never done that, we would like to help you with that today. We'd like to introduce you to the Savior and help you know how you can leave here today knowing that your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven. So my friends, I'm gonna ask you, you are my friend, I'm your friend, and I, I tell you the truth, but if you're without Christ, you're on your way to a devil's hell. And hell is hot and hell is eternal. It's a long, long time to suffer the wrath of God because you rejected his son, Jesus Christ. If you're here today without Christ and you, you, you're just God's uh, pricking your heart and Holy Spirit's dwelling in you and drawing you, Holy Spirit speaking to you about receiving Christ as Savior and you're just not sure and you want to be sure that you're on your way to heaven. I want to pray for you. I don't want to embarrass you. The first thing you need to do is just raise your hand. Pastor, Pastor Greg, pray for me. I want to know how I can take that next step to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand? I'm going to look for just a few moments. Pastor, I need to be saved. Would you pray for me that I'll take that next step for Jesus Christ? I'm going to pray. The instruments are going to play, and we can take some time to really commit to what God spoke to us about today. Let's pray. Father, Oh, how we long for you to work and move. Lord, never have I been, it's been a long time, I should say, I've been, I've been this excited about what you have for us. Well, we want to live blessable lives. Lord, we don't always do that. We pray for your forgiveness. Lord, we forsake some of the things we do, the ways we, we live, and the, the things that distract us from being in a place of blessing. And we pray, Lord, that as we seek to see you move, as we want to follow you, that we'll be obedient, unified, prayerful, and trusting you as we make decisions, as we follow you. I pray for individuals, moms and dads, young people, middle-aged, older people, all walks of life here today, that you'll speak to us, Lord, that we might be willing individually to pay that price. We want to see you do something great. Help us to do what you have us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.